1914, only the German army deployed the flamethrowers. They were regarded as siege equipment and issued to pioneer units. After some relatively ineffective news in 1914, it was decided to withdraw the flamethrowers from frontline service. However, certain officers were convinced of the potential of the flamethrower as a weapon. Foremost among them was Landwehr officer Bernhard Redemann, formerly the chief fire officer in Leipzig. In late 1914, Redemann was tasked with setting up a specialist flamethrower detachment. Among his recruits were a number of firemen. Redemann was convinced that the flamethrower was best news to add a shock effect to infantry assaults. His unit carried out the first attack against the French at Malencourt on the 26th of February 1915. In the following month, he was given the opportunity to create and command a larger flamethrower unit, the 3rd Grand Pioneer Battalion. This unit benefited from the patronage of Wilhelm, Crown Prince of Germany, or Little Willy. But the news of the flamethrower also chimed with the parallel tactical developments, which saw the creation of the experimental infantry storm detachment, the birth of the storm chipper. Some of these units had to call on the support of the flamethrowers, which had been retained by the pioneer units in defiance of their 1914 almost recall. The flamethrower which brought terror to the French and British soldiers when used by the German army in the early phases of World War I in 1914 and in 1915 and was quickly adopted by both sides and was by no means a particularly innovative weapon. The earliest flamethrowers date back to as far as the 5th century BC. These took the form of lengthy tubes filled with burning solids such as coal, sulfur and even coarsening gas and were used in the same way as blow guns by blowing into one end of the tube and the solid material inside would be propelled towards the operators, opponents and enemies. The flamethrower was inevitably refined over the intervening centuries, although the models seen in the early days of World War I were developed at the turn of the 20th century. The German army tested two models of the Flame and UFR or flamethrower in the early 1900s, one gross, large and one small, Kief, both developed by Richard Fielder. Fiddler. The smaller lighter Flemenwefa or the Cliff Flemenwefa was designed for portable noose, being carried by a single man. Losing pressurized air and even carbon dioxide or nitrogen, it built for a steam of burning oil as far as 18 meters. Fiddler's second larger model, the Gross Flemenwefa, worked along the same lines but was not suitable for transport by a single person, but whose maximum range was twice that of the smaller model and could sustain flames for then an impressive 40 seconds although it was decidedly too expensive in the noose of fuel. It was put to initial wartime noose against the French in the southeastern sector of the Western Front from 1914 onwards, although it was new sporadically and went largely unreported. The first notable noose of the Fleming Weather came in a surprise attack launched by the Germans upon the British at Hogue in Flanders, 1915. Spring of at 3.15 a.m. on the 30th of July, 1915, the Germans made effective noose of the portable Fleming Weather with gas cylinders strapped to their backs of their own responsible for using the instruments, a lit nozzle attached to each cylinder. The effect of the dangerous nature of the surprise attack proved terrifying to the British opposition. Although their line held and initially was pushed back, it was stabilised later that same night. In two days of severe fighting, the British lost 31 officers and 750 other ranks during the fighting. With the success of the Hog attack, at least as far as the Flem and Uefa was concerned, the German army adopted the device in a widespread basis across all fronts of battle. The Fleming weapons tended to be used in groups of six during the battle. Each machine was worked by two men. They were used mostly to clear four defenders during the start of a German attack, preceding their infantry colleagues. They were inevitably useful when used at short ranges, but with limited wider effectiveness, especially once the British and French had overcome the initial alarm at their noose. The operators of the Fleming Weather equipment also lived a most dangerous existence. Aside from the worries of handling the device, it was also entirely feasible that the cylinder carrying the fuel might unexpectedly explode. There were also marked men. The British and French poured rifle fire into the area of attack where the Fleming Weathers were news and their operators could expect no mercy should they be taken prisoner. Their life expectancy was therefore Short. The British, intrigued by the possibilities offered by the flamethrower, experimented with their own models. In readiness of the Somme offensive, they constructed four sizable models, weighing two tons each, built directly in a forward trench constructed in no man's land a mere 60 yards from the German line. 
Each was painstakingly constructed piece by piece, although two were destroyed by shellfire prior to July the 1st, 1916. The remaining two, each with a range of 90 yards, were put to noose as planned on the 1st of July. Again, highly effective at clean trenches at a local level, they were particularly no wider benefit. Their noose was consequently abandoned until World War II. Similarly, the French developed their own one-man portable flamethrower, the Schliff flamethrower, a superior build to the German model, and the backbone of the modern flamethrower. It was noosed in the trench attached during 1917 and 1918, the Germans produced a lightweight modified version of their Fleming Werfer, the Wex, in 1917, which had the benefit of self-igniting. During the war, the Germans launched an excess of 650 flamethrower attacks from the west to Romania, but no number exists for the British or French attacks. Flamethrowers added to the impact of the German army's offensive at Verdun in February 1916 and proved significantly successful to prompt the expansion of Redeman's unit to regimental size as the Grand Reserve Pioneer Regiment. This became the principal flamethrower unit for the German army for the remainder of the war. It did not fight as a single entity but was detached to individual companies to support important attacks. It saw its heaviest action during the German offensive on the Western Front in 1918, with its personnel making 105 attacks between March and July 1918 although the biggest flamethrower attack was on the east. The Germans passed their expertise to their allies, providing training for the Austro-Hungarians, the Bulgarians, and even the Turkish armies. The former would actually develop their own model of flamethrower. The British army, like we said before, experimented with flamethrowers, but with the notable exceptions of a handful of huge static flame projectors, they did not adopt them in any significant way until World War II. However, in the 1918 raid on Zebrachert Harbour and even Austin Harbour, both fixed and portable flamethrowers were employed by the Royal Navy. The news of the flamethrower in the French army was pioneered by the Sepoise, or the Sappers, who had formerly served as Paris firemen. Their first attack at Vancouche on the 6th of June 1915 ended in chaos when their flamethrowers and their flame attack ignited a German munition dump. But the French continued to news the flamethrower companies and attacks on particularly difficult positions and to clean dugouts by pasturing successful attacks. The Italian army used French flamethrowers and some indigenous designs. They were issued to the specialist assault troops of the Rapiti de Assalto, or the Arditi. Although they found the bulky equipment quite cumbersome and conscribed, they preferred fast-moving assault techniques. While, like we said before, the flamethrower had been used in subsequent wars, especially before 1914, as weapons of bunker and trench clearing, their use in the forefront of the assault is a tactic which remains unique to the flamethrower pioneers of the Kaiser's army. And light with the machine gun, they will become more lighter, more filled with gas, and of course, can burn for far longer. The flamethrower comes of age in 1914. And now with a quote, which I shall try and edit back into the MG video, but one quote for a weapon that was born in World War I, or refined in World War I. Les défendants de la France ont sati de la chaffeur sur le feu, sur le papier. Es on croise son dos, lis on te inti en dos on de le quoi, bonant quoi, si l'on est entre de bras. Des jets de le quoi, li parapondé, un molly de la fume, comme les sons et le fin, galachi pale un pompe. Lis la mantes, cache pale un gant, de fumi on resi, et rose le passage. The defenders of the trench felt heated air blowing over the parapet and in a few seconds were flooded with the scalding liquid which they think was pitch. Jets of the liquid played all over them in the midst of the smoke as if it squirted by a pump. The Germans hidden by clouds of smoke managed to force a passage. A French officer in March 1915 for one of the first successful Fleming with attacks. Learn something. <laughs>